everyone I'm back again and in this video I'm gonna be taking a kind of first impressions look at Intel's new older like architecture as I managed to get my hands on an i9 12900k CPU this is being marketed as a beast of a chip for content creation so with that in mind I've got an Asus ProArt Z690 create motherboard However, before I even think about building a new workstation PC with it, I want to spend this video having a general play of everything on my test bench and seeing how it performs. But first, let's remove this Windows 10 watermark with today's video sponsor, SCD Key. They offer cheap LBM Windows 10 keys, so just head over there using the link in the description down below. If you enter the discount code TPC at checkout, you'll save yourself an additional 15% off. The key is delivered immediately, and then you're going to search for Activate on your PC and input the code there. Click activate and the watermark is gone. So back to the video. Intel's older lake is exciting, but it's also a little scary as it does things very differently to any desktop CPU I've owned previously. Similar to what we've seen from Apple with its ARM-based M1 chips, 12th generation Intel Old Lake CPUs will have some cores that have been designed to prioritise performance and some cores that have been designed to prioritise efficiency. This hybrid, big, little architecture changes the way we look at desktop CPUs in a way not seen since the jump from single to multi-core CPUs, which was before my time as a PC builder. For me, CPUs have always had just one type of core, and if they had hyper-threading, then the thread count would always double the core count. But today, with the 12900K, I'm looking at a CPU with 16 cores, 8 of them efficiency cores and 8 of them performance cores, but only the P cores have hyper-threading, making this a 16-core, 24-thread CPU. This will take some getting used to for me, and if we keep heading down this path of different core types, future PC spec lists are going to be more confusing than ever before. Taking a look at the motherboard, being in the pro art range, it's designed with creators and professionals in mind, and that's reflected in its aesthetic. If you're fed up with aggressive gaming designs, this could be an option for you. This is a DDR5 motherboard, but there will be other Z690 boards available that are DDR4 instead, as the CPU has support for both memory generations. Asus have decided that the higher end boards in their lineup will be DDR5, which I think makes sense. 12th Gen Intel is also the first to bring us PCIe 5.0, with the board supporting either x16 or xax8 configurations. There's a total of four PCI 4.0 M.2 NVMe SSD slots, all with heat sinks, with the top being wired to the CPU and the other three wired to the Z690 chipset. Using the fourth slot disables these four SATA ports, but I've been SATA less for a few years now and would highly recommend it to everyone. There's an X8 DMI 4.0 connection between the chipset and CPU, so there's plenty of bandwidth for high speed storage. What's missing here is a Gen 5 slot for future high speed SSDs, but they only appear on Asus's more expensive boards, so I think a compromise has been made here to hit its price point. The networking on this board is great with two Ethernet ports, one 10 gigabit and one 2.5 gigabit, and Wi Fi 6E. What more could you ask for from this tier of hardware? A big feature on this board is the two Thunderbolt 4 ports. Thunderbolt 4 offers speeds up to 40 gigabits per second and can connect to either two 4K displays or a single 8K display. And this board has two of them, so dual 8K displays is a possibility. Each Thunderbolt port has its own display port in for connecting to your graphics card. All six of the Type A's are USB 3.2 Gen 2, which is 10 gigabits per second. But if I had any complaints about the Rio, it would be that only having six Type A's seems a little light, but that's nothing a good USB hub wouldn't fix. There's plenty of other features on this board that we've come to expect from a higher end motherboard, like a decent audio solution, a USB-C internal header, seven fan headers, plus an all-in-one header and four RGB lighting headers, three of which are addressable. The LGA 1700 socket requires new mounting hardware, and many cooler manufacturers are offering upgrade kits for your existing coolers. I, however, have used this as an excuse to get my hands on the new Chromax Black Noctua NHU-12A, which is LGA 1700 ready and just looks absolutely amazing like i love the nhu 12a and have used them many times in the past so having a black one is just so cool <laughs> a big debate with this launch is going to be ddr4 versus ddr5 i managed to get my hands on a 32 gig kit of ddr5 6000 memory but unfortunately i'm not permitted to show it on camera which is pretty crazy <laughs> and will make the remainder of this video very difficult to film but I'll try my best now. <laughs> so DDR5 brings with it some larger upgrades and changes and offers higher data rates, higher densities and lower power consumption. 
6,000 mega transfers per second far exceeds any of my DDR4 kits. But the short term problem with DDR5 faces is that DDR4 is now highly refined. This kit, for example, is DDR4 3600 with quick timings of 14, 15, 15, 35. The timings on my kit of DDR5 6000 though are 40, 40, 40, 80. Now, I'm no expert when it comes to memory timings, and I know it's more complicated than being able to directly compare numbers across generations. But it wouldn't surprise me if we see benchmark results that show fast DDR4 kits beating cheaper DDR5 kits in some applications. Okay, so this is my test bench setup. I'm using an RTX 3090, and I had some white anti-vibration corners to my NHU12A, which I had to remount on the CPU, rotated 180 degrees, because for some reason I keep mounting these backwards and then only realising when I go to install the memory. Also, just pretend the test bench isn't bright yellow and matches uh, <laughs> the colour theme of Ring House. So now that I'm in Windows 11, the first thing I wanted to check is the performance tab of the Windows Task Manager. Given that Intel worked with Microsoft on hybrid CPU support, I'd hoped to see some sort of UI differentiation between P cores and E cores, but it just shows all the cores are the same, which is pretty disappointing. The next thing I want to test is heat. It seems like a lot of reviewers are being sent giant 360mm all-in-ones to test Alder Lake, and I'm hoping that's more of an indication of overclocking headroom rather than stock thermals. Given that I'm running an air cooler though, this should be interesting. Okay, so it's been 30 minutes and it's averaging 90 degrees on the hottest core, with the P cores at 4.9 GHz and the E cores at 3.7 GHz. On my 10900K, this would have thermal throttled, so this is actually a huge improvement, especially as this test generates far more heat than you'd see in real world use. Unfortunately, I don't have all of the hardware required to make this an actual 12900K review, but I do have a 12 core Ryzen 9 5900X, which I'll use to give context to my benchmarking results. Also, as I'm curious to see how this will perform as a future workstation upgrade, I'm going to compare to Lotus, my current workstation, just as it is now. Um, it was built in 2019 and runs a Ryzen 3900X. The first test I ran was Cinebench R23, and the 12900K scores an average of 27,647 points, which is the highest score I've ever seen in person. I really wish I had the Ryzen 5950X to see how it stacks up. What's even more impressive though is the single core performance. At over 2,000 points, the 12900K is 25% faster than my Sen3 chip. These P cores are really impressive. And then there's Lotus. There's nothing quite like a new hardware release to make your relatively new PC feel old and slow <laughs> by comparison. <laughs> Moving on to Blender, I wasn't sure which test to run, so I ended up going with a 5 used on the Blender Open Data website. Then there's Handbrake. And this is an 8 minute 4K H.264 file being converted to a 1080p H.265 file. Next is V-Ray and Corona 1.3. There's not a lot for me to say with these test results because it's hardly surprising that the more expensive CPU performs better. Although I did pay £550 for my 5900X roughly 12 months ago, and with the 12900K being available to pre-order now for only £50 more than that, it's cool to see performance in the CPU world moving so quickly. And lastly, for my productivity benchmarks, there's 7SIP, which was interesting. When compressing, the 12900K leads the way as I'd expected, but with decompressing, the 5900X performs better. So moving on to some gaming tests, starting with Forza Horizon 4, which I realise is probably the last time I benchmark hardware with this game, as Forza Horizon 5 comes out tomorrow, which is also my birthday. <laughs> so uh, next is the Shadow of Tomb Raider, and everything is going as expected so far. But then you get to Rainbow Six Siege, and I found that my 1% lows got a little strange. I retested it multiple times, and I checked all of my settings, but perhaps I'm missing something here? With that said, the frame rate numbers are all very high here, so I retested in 1440p to bring them closer to real world frame rate numbers, and here the 5900X and the 12900K perform nearly identically. Strategy games are infamous for being very demanding on your CPU, so I tested AI turn time in Civilization 6. Here we see the 12900K is roughly 3 seconds faster. And lastly there's Watch Dogs Legion, and this preferred Windows 10 in my 5900X testing. This game really likes Old Lake, and as you can see the frame rate increase is pretty large here. During my time testing Old Lake so far, 
And the thing that I find most surprising is how if I didn't know the specs, I wouldn't know that I had E cores and P cores. It just seems like a regular, albeit extremely high performing CPU. On high performance mode, which is my default power plan on a desktop, power draw for the entire system is roughly 115 to 130 watts when watching a YouTube video and around 330 to 360 watts when running Blender on the CPU. This is high power usage compared to my Ryzen rig, but nothing I'd be concerned about. So what are my overall first impressions of the Intel Core i9-12900K? It should come as no surprise that I really like it. It performs really well, and I expect to see it take performance crown from AMD. It took me a while to get my head around Alder Lake's hybrid architecture, because as an enthusiast, I don't have a lot of interest in e-cores. But when you look at the physical space of the die, it seems that eight e-cores takes up the space of two p-cores, and I do think that is a trade worth making. However, there's a couple of factors that would stop me from rushing out and buying one personally. The first is with memory. As regardless of the benchmarking results, I wouldn't personally invest in a new DDR4-based motherboard at this point in time, at least not for a cutting-edge i9. The issue here with DDR5, though, will be its high price point at launch. The second problem is an AMD-shaped one. It looks like we'll be seeing a refresh of Zen 3 with 3D feed cache early next year, which isn't very long to wait to see how Alder Lake holds up against AMD's latest and greatest, especially if you're waiting for DDR5 to settle into the market. As for the motherboard, I like it, and I think it offers a good feature set for its price point. Comparing it to other motherboards on the market, it's really the Thunderbolt 4 ports and the 10 gigabit networking that makes the ProArt Z690 stand out. So, is the 12900K and ProArt Z690 going to become my new workstation CPU motherboard? Yes, <laughs> yes they are, and I already have some ideas of a cool new build to match the board. But yeah, so, uh, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you want to see more of my videos. Thank you to all of my amazing patrons and thank you all so much for watching. Bye!